Um, so what I'll try and talk about in the next sort of 20 minutes or so is, is what is a regional airline now? The, 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 the boundaries and, and rules have changed so much in the last 20 years through, the, through primarily the liberalization of the business. Um, it's a very different business now. How do those airlines fit in, particularly to more, more smaller markets, more remoter regions? And then perhaps look a little bit about uh, some of the developments affecting the business, some of the changes affecting the airline business specifically, particularly consolidation and competition, which are two very big uh, things that are happening in the market and have been happening in the market that are driving changes. And finally, some, some conclusions on perhaps some ideas and thoughts about attracting those operators to, to more remoter areas. So um, what, what is a regional airline? Well, I work for a trade association that represents regional airlines. We have 52 airlines in membership. We also have a number of airports and uh, supporting uh, businesses. But these are the brands of the airlines that are in membership of VRA. Some of those you've probably heard of, you've flown on them. Um, some of them you've probably never heard of, um, and you've never flown on them because they're operating either in very niche markets or they're operating a business model where actually you never see their brand. Um, so uh, Nora, Nordic Regional is a good example. It's, it's all on behalf of Finnair. So you probably rarely see their brand unless you happen to know it's operated by them. Or when you get on board the aircraft, you notice as you board by the door, operated by the SAS routes here. When you get on board the ATRs, you'll see operated by Flyb. So that's the business model that um, a lot of these airlines fly. Some of them have very particular markets. Vidro in Norway has a very, very strong brand in northern Norway. It's a, very, you know, it's a brand associated with that part of the region, and it works well. Binter Canarias, Binter, is this working yet? <coughs> is an airline in, in the Canaries. Um, has a very strong brand there. People fly between the islands on Binter Canarias. In the Azores, Sata uh, flies into island services, so very, very strong brands. Whereas an airline like, for example, uh, Jota in the UK, you'll have never heard of them because they operate on behalf of other operators. Uh, but they are operators in, the, in their own right. This is how these airlines are spread across Europe. Um, so there's a, there's a big spread of these 52 all over, um, all over Europe. In terms of their dimensions and how big they are, it's a fleet of about 600 aircraft. Um, and uh, if you combine them all together, the passengers they carry, um, they are about as big as uh, the biggest airlines in Europe. So they're similar sort of size to EasyJet, Ryanair, Lufthansa Group, and so on, collectively. So you can see they're quite, quite small, actually. And what do, the, what do these airlines do? Who flies? This is, an article, <coughs> this is a chart from, uh, produced by uh, ATR, in fact, um, identifying on, on distance across the um, lower scale here and the number of passengers carried. So you can see an enormous number of people, and this is actually globally, are flying typically less than 1,000 nautical miles in, in, in routes. And in fact, 50% of passengers worldwide are flying less than 500 nautical miles, which is a surprising statistic because we all think about long haul, the glamour of it, longer routes. But the vast majority of air travellers, or at least half of them, are actually travelling on short distance air journeys. So there's a big market there um, that a lot of airlines have exploited over the years. Regional airlines in terms of their business models and how they've changed. We still have the independent airlines, the ones that I mentioned, that have their own brand operating their own, often very niche services to very niche markets. But we have a, a, a new breed of airlines, wholly owned subsidiaries. So we have airlines like KLM City Hopper, a wholly owned subsidiary of KLM, but it's an operating airline in its own right, providing services for KLM. We have um, a, a number of franchise carriers, so the best, I'm sure you all know what franchises are, but Burger King is your best example. You pay money to use a brand that everybody's heard of, and you pay money to that brand. So we have a number of franchise operators. Our biggest is probably Air Nostrum in Spain, which is a franchise operator for Iberia. Um, so they sell tickets as if they were Iberia, but they're a standalone airline. But the biggest growth market is in this final segment, which is capacity purchase. Uh, we call it ACMI operators who are providers of capacity, and they will provide that capacity to anybody. So of our 52 airlines, 70% of them are what we call ACMI providers. So the best example here is Flybe, providing services to SAS, or indeed Nordic Region, which is a sort of mixture between wholly owned and capacity purchase, providing all their capacity on behalf of a network carrier, or any carrier, in fact. 
We have airlines providing in the summer season capacity to uh, um, Ryanair, ASL Airlines leases an aircraft in the summer. We have an airline in the UK called Titan, which provides capacity to EasyJet across the summer. So it's, it's a growing business model for those big airlines that need a bit more capacity at short, medium or, or long term basis. It can be the aircraft, an aircraft has broken down, so you can phone up an airline, they'll provide you with an aircraft. It can be a longer term lease over six months or three months. These are just some of the, the dimensions of the, um, of the uh, um, airlines that uh, are in membership, where they fly. Um, and some of the interesting statistics is the, is the contribution to European GDP that they produce. So despite being small operators, they're still significant in driving the economies of a lot of European countries. And this is the sort of dimension that I mentioned before. So collectively, when you look at flights, they're, they're as big as the biggest in, uh, in uh, Europe. So they're, they're also providing a significant amount of business traffic, which is this blue bar. So in other words, they're operating at times when business people travel. Um, and that tends to be a characteristic of, of regional operators as well. Where do they fit into the market? I've got a series of slides here just to demonstrate the sort of demographic and, and economic data provided by the European Commission. So the first one is GDP per inhabitant. It's a little bit out of date because it's 2011 but it was the most up-to-date data I can find, but it wouldn't, probably doesn't change a lot. So the darker the blue, the higher the GDP. Quite interesting what happens here in Norway. Um, I actually suspect that's changed a little bit because of the oil price reducing. A lot of that Norwegian wealth is from oil. Um, but what, what you tend to see is, you know, as you get to the middle of Europe, the average GDP increases, okay? Because the core of Europe is where it all happens. And if you move to the outer parts of Europe, it gets less affluent, less wealthy, less well connected. So the conclusion here really is that people work and they migrate to higher GDP concentrations. So they need to travel, they need to move, so they need air travel. So air travel is a very important part of driving these GDP changes. Population density, another one provided by the European Commission here. So the darker the brown, the more densely populated. Um, that we see. So again, the conclusion is simple, is that people tend to gravitate, whether they're going to study, whether they're visiting friends, whether they're business connections. People need, need to move, they need to travel, they need to move between regions of higher density and lower density. And, and air travel is an important part of that movement of people that has to happen. Employment rate um, uh, across Europe as well. And again, the darker the brown, the higher the employment rate in those countries. And again, what happens? People move to where there's jobs. Um, Spain is, is, a, is, is a very good example. Extre has had extremely low um, employment rates, high unemployment rates. People have moved out of Spain to where jobs are, but they still need to come home, come home to visit their families, and hopefully they'll come back and work there eventually when the economy picks up. So they need air travel. Um, and workers migrate to where that work is. People migrate to where those, those jobs and those uh, businesses are. Um, and that needs air travel. So air travel from the outside of Europe to the core and connections to the core of Europe will always be essential. Will always be essential because some of these data probably won't change fundamentally over the next 10 to 15 years because Europe is the way it is and we have to accept that. The other one is rail. So uh, rail is a big issue in Central Europe. High-speed rail is very developed. So this chart shows the density of rail networks um, across Europe. And again, the darker the green, the more dense the rail networks. And of course, it makes sense. So it's, it's kind of the reverse here. So the less dense the rail networks are, the more you need air travel. Now, I don't know what the plans are in Finland to build rail networks, but I would argue it's, it's an awful lot easier to put an air service in it that it is to build a 200 kilometer high speed rail. Some governments don't think that, crazily enough, but it is a fact. It's far more cost effective to put air services in into these regions around the outside of Europe than it is in the core. If you're traveling between Paris and Brussels, there is no air service anymore because the train runs every hour and it takes an hour and a half, I think, Annabelle, to go from uh, Brussels to Paris. So it's, it's, it's very convenient, but that's not the case on the periphery of Europe. So, you know, the conclusion is where there is no competing or complementary modes, air travel is the solution. <laughs> and in somewhere like Finland, clearly air travel is the solution that makes the economy work for transportation. 
Um, and, and, and how do these airlines, how do our airlines fit into that model? Well, we do a number of things in amongst those business models I was talking about. Feeding major hubs, feeding secondary hubs, um, linking lower volume point to point services, the kind of inter-island services I spoke about before in the Azores and the Canaries, where air travel is the only means of getting from A to B. Northern Norway is a good example as well, and I think here in Finland as well, of course, getting from A to B, sometimes the only cost-effective quick option is by air. Providing services where no other mode can compete, where there is no highway, where there is no railroad, air services are the only way um, of getting uh, to and from those places. Um, and of course, ensuring Europe's remoter regions stay connected. Um, and I've got a few little examples of how regionals fulfill that need. And they're examples outside of Finland, because I thought it would be good to, to show you some, some non some non-Finnish examples. So here's the network of where all our members fly. Um, these are all the points that they serve across Europe. Um, this is the Finnish network, by the way, um, which I took from the SAS website. No, from the Finnair website. Um, we, don't, we don't have it on our chart, you can see there, because all of the services in uh, Finland are actually operated by Finnair, which are not a member of ERA, but they're operated by Nora, or they're operated by SAS. Um, but they're operated by our members through Flyb and through contractual arrangements between those airlines and the regional traffic providers. Just three or four examples. This is an airline in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in down in Greece um, serving uh, Crete, and it's an airline called Sky Express, and it's linking the island communities um, there, providing an essential lifeline, and almost all their routes are public service obligation routes, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Public service obligation routes are routes where the local government or the state government supports the route. This is um, our air, an airline in Iceland, Air Iceland, which provides essential regional feed and regional connectivity um, to those regions. And Iceland, as an aside, talking about an amazing country that has done incredible things with air travel and growing, the, and growing its, its economy on tourism. And Iceland is absolutely incredible. I was there th three, uh, about a month ago. And Air Iceland was telling me that year round now, they do not have enough hotel bedrooms. Year round. So if it wasn't for Airbnb, the, the bit where you can hide, they would be a, it would be a disaster zone. And a huge enabler of that has been the airline. If you look at what Iceland Air has done, it's incredible where they've come from as a, as a very, very small airline to what they're doing now, connecting all of Europe to the US and building that business model. They found a particular niche that has added hugely to the economic development of Iceland. And again, there's no reason why such a thing could not happen here in uh, Tampere in the future if you find that niche. Um, linking remoter regions, this is the airline uh, Binta that I spoke about that links uh, the Canaries to mainland Europe and also provides inter-island services. Uh, this is the airline in the Azores, Sata Air Azores, providing services between the islands. There is no alternative there. You can't take the uh, train, you can't take your car across some of these uh, waterways. Feeding primary hubs, and this is uh, the network of KLM City Hopper, and I think it was Tom mentioned uh, KLM into Schiphol. You know, if, if I was in Tampere thinking, where, where should I link to? Well, Amsterdam, Paris, Munich maybe, that's it. You don't need anything else, because those three, you're connected to everywhere in the world, particularly when you have the Air Baltic connections, um, when you have the SS and the Finnair connections on top of that, and then you have Ryanair providing point to point. All the boxes have been ticked. And if you look at what KLM is doing with its subsidiary KLM City Hopper in the UK market, if you live in the regional point in the UK, your option to travel globally or to another destination in Europe is through Schiphol. Because KLM City Hopper serves airports like Norwich, where, frankly, nobody wants to go. Um, and I can say that as a British person. But they have a double daily flight to Norwich. So why not have a, imagine if you had a double daily here, and the aircraft they operate, 70 to 90 seats, perfect. You're entirely connected to the whole KLM Air France network. Um, and you, you, you get to travel internationally. You travel to Riga, you're connected to the entire Air Baltic network. So the, you only need four or five key connections, and the whole world and the whole of Europe is uh, opened up. Secondary capitals as well, this is um, uh, Luxair. Uh, sorry, no, it's not. This is Adria, um, our airline Adria, linking flights out of uh, Ljubljana. So these airlines, where there's not a big network carrier, they tend to connect 
secondary capitals. And I would, Wolfgang might, might not agree, but I would class Air Baltic as a little bit like that, as a network carrier for a secondary country. So you're not going to be as big as Frankfurt. But you, know, you have a very developed network there in Riga, and a very successful airline, the biggest in the Baltics, you know, um, with, with aspirations to grow with a brand new aircraft type as well. So this is exactly the sort of airline that exists that not everybody is aware of. This is the um, Luxair network out of <coughs> Luxembourg, connecting Luxembourg to all sorts of different points in Europe. Again, a secondary airline, a secondary network carrier. Um, so moving on to some of the markets affecting the business, and, and <coughs> we have a very interesting business in Europe. The airline business was deregulated, as many of you know, in the, in the 1990s. And what the European Commission did was it set free the whole business. So you could establish an airline in any member state of the EU and freely fly in any other country. It was an incredible step in deregulating the business. It, um, it, it unleashed the low-cost revolution. Incredible if you look at the history of what happened with airlines like EasyJet and Ryanair. I mean, whether you like them or don't, it is incredible what they've done. Um, Ryanair was a member of ERA, actually, um, pre-1994. It was a failed regional airline, losing a lot of money operating BAC 111s, um, and ATRs, and it turned itself to a low-cost carrier. And look at it now, EasyJet. I remember I was at university at Cranfield, and they were started operating in 1994, I think, um, with, I think, two 737s operated by Airfoil in the UK. And everyone thought, oh, you know, what's this airline? Look at it now, it's incredible. Um, and I think the change in the business, I would say, is that can never happen again the origins of, of airlines like Ryanair and EasyJet, because if EasyJet started now, the equivalent of EasyJet, I won't use Ryanair, if EasyJet started operating again, British Airways would kill it, kill it dead, immediately. And they probably should have done that back then, because they could have done, <laughs> you know? Because that's the way, since the airline business was deregulated, the airlines now operate. If they see competition, it's a bloodthirsty industry, and they will kill any airline that comes onto their patch. It's what airlines like to do, you know, and whether you like it or not. It's an incredibly competitive business, and that drives big changes in the business, and it's driving consolidation in the business. So it's a kind of a vicious cycle, really, is that competition is driving consolidation because it's a free market, and that's how free markets work. You know, airlines fight for customers. They offer the lowest fares to get more customers, and if that's at the expense of another airline, then so be it. And I think that's important to remember when you're looking at developing a region like Tampere, is that airlines are not there for the benefit of the region. They're there to make money, first and foremost. Um, and um, the most successful airlines in Europe are the ones that have set aside the nostalgia of traveling and moving people and said it's just about the money. It's just about making money. We might not like that. I don't particularly like it because I like aviation, I like airlines, and I like the element that there's travel there's connectivity associated with the business. But that's not the case anymore. And I think airline senior management have to be ruthless and have to be serious. Otherwise, they won't make money. They won't survive because it is such a competitive business. What has that consolidation and competition done to Europe? So this is a slide that I use. So 55% of the intra-European market within Europe by seats is captured by five airline groups at the moment. So this was from September this year. So that is Ryanair, EasyJet, IAG, which is British Airways and um, uh, Iberia. It's the Lufthansa Group, which is wider than just Lufthansa. So it's Swiss, Brussels Airlines, Austrian. Um, and the final one is KLM Air France Group. So those five carriers have an incredible market share. The remaining 45% of the intra-European market is split between 116 separate operators. Now, in, in my very simple schematic, I've made them all the same size, but they're not. Yeah, we have a range of airlines. You have some pretty big ones like SAS, Finnair. You have some medium-sized ones, I'd say, like Air Baltic. And then you have some very, very small ones that are operating four or five aircraft. But the point is there's a big, because of the liberalization of the business, these airlines have incredible market power. They don't quite have the market power that the US has which is consolidated down to three airlines in the US, providing all of the capacity in that business. 
And is it any surprise that the US airlines are the most profitable they've ever been? Because they are moving to a monopoly where they can charge what they like. And that is the ultimate aim of a free market. Eventually, one day, many years from now, as you believe economic theory, there will be one airline in Europe. It probably won't happen because you know, economic theory is not quite that perfect. But whether we like it or not, these five carriers are driving the networks, the development of Europe. So if you and Tampere want to develop, you have to be aware of that and look at these airlines and work with them to bring their networks to you. And then look at these ones to provide that extra niche or particular capacity that will connect you between your point and the rest of the world. Um, so just to, to, to finish off some final thoughts on um, attracting smaller, attracting air services to smaller markets. So just, just um, a number of bullets here, and, and this is a lot of what Tom was saying earlier, a lot of it's common sense, and there's some you know, far more experienced network planners in the audience than me, and far more experienced aviation people in the audience than me. Um, but these are just some of the facts. You know, what is that market here in Tampere? Is it business? Is it leisure? Is it visiting friends and family? What is the market? Why are people traveling? You know, what's, what's the demographics? How big is the market? Can it ever sustain five A380s? Who knows? Um, Emirates is serving some incredible destinations that you would never imagine could sustain that level of capacity, particularly in the UK. Um, uh, an example, have you ever been to Glasgow in the UK? It's not a particularly nice place. But Emirates operates a double daily 777-300 in there. It's incredible. I don't know how they do it. I have no idea. But some of these markets are unbelievable how you can unleash them and, and, and tap into them if you have the right uh, uh, information and market power. What other alternative means of transport are there? So, you know, what else exists here in Tampere? There's no high-speed rail. So um, the highway network is, is, is okay, but it's perhaps not as developed as it is in Central Europe. So actually, you have an immediate advantage on using air travel. Um, how much does it cost to travel? It's a huge driver. The deregulation of the business has driven price as one of the key drivers of consumers. And you've only got EasyJet and Ryanair to look at. Price is such a driver of people's behavior in Europe, and it still seems to be. We all seem to be prepared to save five euros to take our flight and then go to the airport and merrily spend 20 euros on a coffee and a donut. But that's the way we behave or spend more. I spend more when I go to Brussels on the taxi from the airport downtown than I do on the flight from the UK to Brussels. But I'm still worried about saving those five euros. Um, it's the way we as consumers behave and it's the way the market has developed. What, what, what other competition exists on the market? Um, and it is a very competitive business, as I said before. And if there is competition, generally speaking, the way airlines behave, it will be a bloodbath because they will try and beat each other on price to gain market share. That's how they do it. Uh, airlines will price dump on certain routes to get market share. Um, they will do all sorts of uh, commercial tricks to take an advantage there. Um, the use of public service obligations, actually there's, there's none here in Tampere, I don't think, which is a means of using state or government money to support route development, to support routes. If you look at Norway and the network that exists in northern Norway of Vidaro, um, they have an incredibly developed air transport market there that's all public service obligation routes. So I think that's something you could look at here in terms of looking at, at, at how those markets could be used. And finally, what, how easy is the operation? So is it, is it challenging weather-wise, which clearly you have here? You know, and you, again, you have an advantage if you have operators that are used to operating in those kind of um, businesses. So, the final couple of slides, just some, some observations on the business. So strong competition, it's not going to change. Pressure on costs will always be a driver um, of the business. Price, as I said before, will remain a huge driver uh, for competition. And consolidation will continue to happen. And regionals, those smaller airlines, are the ones who are going to feel the pressure more than those big dominant market players. They're the ones who are going to struggle and find it harder to survive. Um, this is a, a, just a quote from a CEO of where he thought the market was moving. So he thought, and this was from about six years ago, um, and it's uh, that the air traffic market in Europe is moving to a situation where it will be dominated by three or four legacy carriers, three or four low-cost carriers, and a variety of regional airlines exploiting specific niche markets. Well, we're seeing that come true now. 
because you've seen that slide, and that will evolve more and more, and you'll <coughs> probably end up with less than three or four uh, low-cost and legacy carriers. So, remote regions like remoter regions, not remote regions, remoter and smaller markets like Tampere will still rely heavily on air transport. The demographics of Europe that I tried to show means that air transport will always play a very important role in connecting communities and regions. Regional carriers, I would argue, small and medium-sized operators will always play a bigger role in these kind of markets than the big mainstream carriers. Um, and I think as an industry, we need to keep supporting air transport. And finally, um, actually, in that competing and consolidated business, attracting air services is a very hard job. So, you know, it's not an easy task you have here in Tampere, but I think it's a very, very worthy cause to try and attract more air services to it. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.